Of Doha, which I agree with Ellen, needs to be used a lot more, right? And, and we should hold it up. 
but also are the limitations due to a failure to frame that in a rights framework? Um, you know, it really doesn't, right? And so there's that question. And then the second question for me is, is it, was it the wrong forum? Do we need to think about other framing opportunities and other forums that can augment Doha to create a different, to build a different kind of norm than we have right now? Um, and I just want to thank everybody. That this is a really great panel. But um, John, can I have a question for you? You were sort of dancing around something throughout your presentation. I want to push one a little harder. Um, you were talking about a utilitarian framework versus a natural rights framework. And the case of ACTA, the privacy in Europe was a pretty powerful way to mobilize people against ACTA. Um, and so I'm wondering whether you would think in terms of strategies in different contexts, emphasizing one versus other natural rights versus utilitarian to make the pitch or you know the, the framing um, would have more traction in different jurisdictions? Or are you implying that a natural rights frame might be better for things like traditional knowledge and, and some of the other things? Because it seemed to kind of go back and forth. I wasn't really clear where you went with that. Could you make comment maybe a layman for this group? Um, this discussion is mostly focused on the help of uh, developing countries and these developed countries access to medicine. But if you look on products, uh, um, such a population in uh, developed countries all also need uh, accessible drugs. And uh, budgets of major pharma uh, related to developing country, countries it may be uh, from 5 to 10 percent, maybe less. And what's affected the, the business decision is uh, the, the policies, government policies, major countries who make medicine accessible there. And as a result, not uh, maybe because of activism, uh, the, the, the companies is cutting back the research, at least in major countries, and closing uh, campuses. And what I noted, it was surprisingly noted, that the companies who is on the top of the medicine access list, Glaxo Falcon and Sanofi Medis, is those one who closed the most campuses in the United States. Bridgewater is the major campus which I worked for, was closed uh, two years ago, entirely. So when the discussion is taken of context, of broader picture of what influence uh, of uh, pharmaceutical companies, I think uh, it's kind of not looking for the big impact and maybe, I don't know any solution, but I just pointed out that when you look for other factors and try to influence for them in major country, it, it may give more impact for accessibility uh, for, for the drugs in development countries when the companies could tend to more. Hi, um, I'm Gabe, Gabriel Levitt uh, from PharmacyChecker.com, and I am not a lawyer and uh, feel completely outgunned here, but I do want to bring, first I just want to thank Sean um, for, for hold, 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 holding this conference. Um, uh, taking off on what, what this gentleman said, um, Access to medicines is not just a problem of lower income countries. Just one fact, according to the Commonwealth Fund, um, 48 million Americans did not take their prescription medication in 2010 due to high drug prices. Um, uh, there are laws in the United States, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, that ban the personal drug importation of med med medicines. And there are a few million Americans who, who uh, do personally import drugs now, often because they just cannot af affo afford those drugs. And their means of obtaining them is through online pharm pharmacies. And I just wanted to explore throughout the conference if there was a human rights law basis to challenge the um, personal drug importation ban here, where we know for a fact that for over 10 years, Americans have been safely accessing needed medications online. 
and I can tell you, and then I'll fin finish up. It is the White House Office of the Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator, ironically, who's been leading the charge to shut down online pharmacies. Now, many of these pharmacies ought to be shut down, but others should not, and that gets into online access areas and how governments are taking action to shut down different um, online access that can affect access to medicine. So just to conclude, is I'd like to learn more about legal arguments in human rights to protest the personal drug importation ban. Thank you. I'm Don Baker. I just wondered if you could comment, uh, as you know, so much drug development, basic research at least occurs within academic institutions on a worldwide basis. And here in the United States, to the extent it's federally funded, you know, it, it, it finds its way to market through a license under the Bayh-Dole Act. I'm wondering if you can comment or do you know of instances in which uh, where it may not be clear whether it should, whether it should be mandatory or simply uh, or suggested uh, of compliance with these guidelines, whether a company's compliance with those types of standards is something that in a formal way academic institutions should, are able to take into account as policy matters when they do their license negotiations, uh, either pro or con. Okay, so I realize we have a few more questions waiting, but I'm going to cut it off from there and encourage those people to use the break time for it. But let me give a couple minutes. We won't respond to everything, but you can respond to anything you'd like to. Oh, dear. <laughs> you don't have to respond to everything. <laughs> well, in response to what you said, maybe we should explore the idea of having an international competition authority because of course that would be <laughs> that would uh, okay um, I, I want to make a comment about essential medicines and about the DOBA declaration I think we have to be very careful with throwing the WHO essential medicines concept out of the window before we fully understand what it is because the list is only the WHO model list is only an aspect of it but the concept of essential medicines is much broader and is incredibly useful and in fact many countries do have an essential medicines list also the WHO is again under influence of HIV activism moving away from using cost considerations too heavily in determining what is an essential medicine or not and I think we'll very soon see some fairly expensive cancer drugs entering the list this brings me to my next point. I think with the Doha Declaration, I think we're at the beginning of seeing the implementation. Of the Doha Declaration was in a way a little bit ahead of its, ahead of its time. Um, the, uh, and where I think we're going to see major changes is where countries start to use it for uh, non-communicable diseases and, and cancer drugs, heart disease, whatever, which is already beginning to happen. And I think that will create the kind of earthquakes that can provoke um, further, further change. Um, the Doha Declaration has been used much, much more broadly than is commonly, uh, commonly known, in particular in Sub-Saharan Africa, where many of the HIV medicines were actually patented on a very large scale least developed countries and developing countries with reference to the Doha Declaration have allowed blanket importation of generic medicines, whether they were patented or not. And that really has created the market for these medicines. The effects of that have been huge. And um, that was very much helped by uh, procurement agents that had sort of standard government use declarations that they used with those countries, and several of us have been, have been involved in that. But um, that, that, that is perhaps something that should be documented in greater detail because it is a little known fact that the effect of the Doha Declaration on the ground in real practice has been much, much more significant than, um, than, than what is. Than what is known. There's a little bit about it in my 2009 book, but 
I'm I, I here assuming you think, yeah, well, you should have written that up. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of the should or must, all human rights obligations are must by their very nature. Does uh, the, uh, the TRIPS agreement violate human rights standards? Definitely. And there are numbers of human rights documents that, of course, no one outside the human rights community ever looks at, which say this. Um, the reason that many in the human rights uh, community work with trying to chip away at the TRIPS agreement is just a matter of strategy because uh, trying to condemn TRIPS altogether is not a very efficacious uh, approach. And I think the great limitation of the Doha Agreement still is for countries without manufacturing capacity and the need um, for the international community to allow countries like India with the capacity to matter generic drugs to continue to export to those countries even now that their phase in period is over. Okay, just comments on a, a couple of the very helpful uh, interventions. Uh, firstly, Amy asked for perhaps examples from South Africa of where the interface between human rights and, and access to medicines had occurred in a judicial context. And um, again, I can give you the citation, Aventis and Cipla, July 2012, another one, where Cipla was importing the means by which they could make this uh, uh, taxol-based uh, chemotherapy drug. And the Supreme Court in South Africa said that although the public interest cannot be ignored um, and treatment uh, uh, can be an amicus curiae in that dispute, um, that, that the constitutional right in Section 27.1 doesn't trump the right of the patent seller effectively. That's what they said. So um, that would be a, be a more pertinent example of that. Now, Susan's point about whether um, whether uh, natural rights trump utilitarian justifications. I mean, I'm struggling with that. I mean, well, one, of, one of the issues that I was hinting at was that if we were not adopting or not accepting a utilitarian justification for the grant of intellectual property rights and saw them through a natural rights prism, then the nature of the debate about the hierarchy of rights in relation to the right to health and the right to enjoy and benefit from intellectual property, that the nature of the discussion would be different. That was kind of what I was struggling with there. Um, my final point, just coming back to Sean's comments um, about whether perhaps community rights have less traction than individual rights. I just find it so difficult to unpack all these narratives um, about policy space and um, uh, why certain certain issues run and others get blocked. Um, so I do think in everything that we discuss, it's difficult to unpack the role that the human rights discourse plays in achieving certain outcomes because of, because there's so many other variables that we have to take into account. Thank you. I'm conscious I'm standing between people on break, so I'll try to be there. Yeah. yeah. Very brief. Um, generally, on, on the rugby framework and uh, where else it's been applied, uh, it, it comes very much out of the experience of the extractive industries. And I, I, I take um, your, your point, I think it's a very good point, Amy, that the it's, it's very gray oftentimes. What is it that companies should and should not do? And that sometimes do no harm actually means that companies have to proactively do something. Um, on the specific application of that to patenting, um, I, I would argue, I'm not totally convinced actually that companies should restrain themselves from patenting. Uh, I mean, I think they should, but I'm not convinced that that's a human rights obligation. I think it really has to rest on states to restrict the granting of patents uh, rather than asking companies not to apply for patents. Um, 
And I think that the, the likelihood that they will do so is very low, first of all, and that which countries that would apply to is another important question, because if we say uh, pharmaceutical companies should not be able to patent anywhere in the world, we need a whole new R&D system which some of us are, of course, working on and advocating for, but we're not, we're not there yet. So I think it raises some, some difficult questions in terms of application. Um, but on, on the broader question that you raised, which I think is really interesting regarding TRIPS and its fundamental inconsistencies, uh, I think it's useful to refer to Susan Sell's work looking at, of course, the origins of TRIPS and the role that industries played in the creation of TRIPS. And of course, if companies didn't lobby, you know, would we have trips today? Probably not. Uh, would we have a problem with parallel importation of medicines into the US from Canada? Probably not. I mean, there are lots of systemic problems that come from uh, this kind of pervasive <laughs> influence of private interests in, in government. And I think that's something that there has been some emphasis on in the public debate, certainly in this country, uh, with Citizens United and, and ongoing uh, Supreme Court cases, but not enough in the field of access to medicines. Um, and those who work on these issues day to day know that this pervasive influence is very strong, but I think there's not been enough of a call to um, ask for more transparency in that regard, to demand more transparency through legislative means if, if necessary. Um, and if that sounds like a pipe dream to some people, I think it's interesting to look at the debate around clinical trials data that's taking place uh, primarily in Europe today, where governments are becoming, I think, more willing to consider legislative action to require transparency in clinical trial data, which was unimaginable even just a few years ago, and we see industry responding uh, to that through, through voluntary um, measures. Um, let, me, let me just conclude by, by saying that I think that the um, it, it's always, sometimes it takes a little longer, sometimes it takes less time, but we always end up with this question of, of how research and development happens in, in the pharmaceutical industry and the role that exclusive rights play in creating incentives and driving priorities in research and development. And I think that until we can find a new way of, of driving R&D into the most important health needs, uh, we're not going to be able to make the IP system work for human rights. Uh, and we need to really address the the problem at the source, and that this is not a problem that can be addressed by any one single country, not even in the United States alone, but that it really requires um, action among states. And I think this is where the emphasis in the Hunt Guidelines on voluntary um, neglected disease investments is misses the point a bit, and that it's really um, the obligation of states to create a framework that provides the sustainable incentives um, and regulations that drive R&D that meets the needs of society. That's an obligation of governments and not uh, one that we can put on the shoulders of an industry. Thanks. Uh, thank you to our panelists.